Hello, everyone. My name is Danny Lay. I'm a librarian here at the Marin County Free Library. And I'm just grateful to have, that you all are uh, here with us this afternoon, or if you're watching on a later time, you know, joining in for this wonderful talk with lovely Umayam. And uh, I just want to read her bio real quick, because she does some amazing work. And uh, we'll get into the interview right now. So lovely is a writer and a nuclear non-proliferation expert. She is the founder of the Bomb Shelter Policy and Art Collective, a creative organization pushing for an active exploration of arts, culture, and history to promote nuclear non-proliferation, arms control, and disarmament. Bomb Shelters is the first prize recipient of the U.S. Department of State Innovation and Arms Control Challenge in 2013. She was a foreign policy interrupted fellow and an N squared innovator fellow. Lovely is also a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center where she conducts research on technologies like blockchain or disrupted ledger technology and their potential applications for tracking nuclear materials and protecting related facilities. Without further ado, everybody welcome Lovely. What's hey. up? <laughs> nice to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm so excited to to just uh, hang out with you and uh, talk about some of my work. Yeah, and it's it's really here to celebrate what you do and who you are, and just really uh, as we've you know talked in the past, uh, a subject uh, that's often you know you know left to popular culture to, to understand or mm -hmm. you know misconstrued through history books or the correct history books, right? Right. So right. Um, basically, for First question is, how are you doing? How have has everything been during this pandemic for you? I know you recently you've relocated to LA, uh, mm -hmm. back to your home uh, area. So how's that been? Man, it's been a, a combination of, of emotions and, and experiences, both, you know, terrible, but also a lot of silver linings. I think that that's a pretty universal reaction. Um, in that I'm incredibly thankful to be home, to have a family that's doing well, keeping safe, but at the same time, just really having to adapt to sort of the whiplash of, um, I guess, mental um, health, you know, challenges given the pandemic, the political chaos, police brutality. It's just a lot to take in. I feel like we're all grappling with the cascading crises around us. But also, I think that that's really allowed me to just step back and be grateful for what I have and knowing that I have community to, to lean on to. So it's just been, it's a mix. But I'm I'm choosing to to appreciate my blessings. So that's that's where I'm at. And and of course, like living in California, it's such a again difficult, but also an amazing homecoming to just be here. I know you lived uh, for a while in DC. You know, close yeah. to work. Um, and but you know, definitely the West Coast welcomes you back with open arms. And uh, I definitely hope to hang out with you and uh, Adriel sometime soon again. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, I want to just jump into just like, let's talk about uh, who you are. And I know in one of your recent virtual talks, you know, you mentioned that uh, an, an episode of The Simpsons, you know, became one of your inspirations for the work you do today. And, you know, definitely with Springfield being, you know, close to a nuclear plant, you know, I was like, I found it, I chuckled when I heard that, but I definitely understand when, you know, serendipitous moments of, of pop culture, especially when you're young, come in and comes and affects you so much. So can you walk us through through the life of a young lovely and how you arrived to where you're at today? Oh man, um, well, I appreciate that question. No one's really asked about young lovely before. <laughs> young and lovely. I just really love that framing of it. Um, young Lovely was, um, you know, loved books. Uh, one of my, or at least according to my mother, one of her um, earliest memories of me is just surrounding my crib with books, even though I was not even reading yet. It was just, I'd prefer to be around them than stuffed animals and such. I've always been really paper-based, like really love stationaries and all that. Very much influenced by my two brothers 
who are currently based in the Philippines. Um, and, and they're the ones who actually introduced me to The Simpsons. And a lot of the American pop culture uh, that I've come to just love as part of my Filipino experience. Uh, so I watched, Young Lovely watched a lot of WWF <laughs> as well as uh, The Simpsons, even though I was still learning English at that time. Um, and the episode that I talked about in uh, the, the event that I attended um, and presented at was, was about, I think, the, the nuclear power plant in um, Springfield and how uh, I think it, it made Mr. Burns glow and people thought that he was an alien. And that particular scene just sort of stuck with me. And I completely forgot it after, you know, years. And when I started learning about nuclear issues again, that definitely came up uh, in mind. And just kind of realizing that a lot of people start out with seeing nuclear references in um, you know, a lot of uh, books or movies or, or TV shows, but not really understanding what it is by definition. And that misalignment can generate or rather lead to uh, misunderstanding. And so in some ways, The Simpsons was incredibly formative because it introduced me to the word nuclear, even though I didn't really know what it was. And it also allowed me to compare like, okay, this is how it's represented in most of pop culture. Um, and this is actually what it means to, to work on it in real life. I'm, I'm interested in, uh you know, in this, just because also as an Asian American and especially going towards career and professional pathways that our parents do not understand, what do they think about, you know, um, and especially, I guess, down down the line uh, in your education, that your, uh, the choices you made for your career, at least in also your creativity uh, uh, kind of interests, were they supportive or were, or were they kind of just like, well, let, let's give her, let her do what she wants to do. <laughs> so I was also going to say in relation to your young, lovely question, I feel like I inherited my mother's perfectionism mm -hmm. and also my father's risk taking. And so that has become a very interesting combination in and of itself. But my parents are very conservative as first generation um, immigrants, you know, they went through the hardship of losing their sense of stability in the Philippines and coming here, having pretty much nothing and having to build from the ground up. Um, my father was um, an electrician, a very experienced electrician and basically had to start over and became a security guard here in the United States. And I can only, you know, imagine what that must have been to have that kind of life changing, um, you know, change <laughs> in, in one's life. So they were really expecting the kids to be the ones who would create the foundation of stability for the family. But that doesn't necessarily mean they weren't, um, encouraging of our creative pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were just, you know, they would suggest that could be on the side, it could complement or even help whatever it is that you're really thinking about um, doing, but it shouldn't be at the center. I mean, I was perfectly fine with that. I think that the biggest tension within the family is uh, geography, actually. There was an expectation that I would stay in LA um, and, and you know we've already fractured our family geographically by moving to the United States they couldn't really imagine the, you know the remaining core in LA to fracture some more and end up in different uh, states but I really wanted to to leave because a lot of what I was interested in wasn't necessarily in Los Angeles. Uh, and so that was like the biggest sort of tension point. But I would say that they understood that the way that I learned 
is highly creative. I liked being very visual. I liked engaging people. I love writing, reading. And so they were always supportive of that. Um, I'm glad to hear their, uh, one, their support and two, to, you know, to empower their daughter to be that trailblazer and an amazing writer. As I found out through this research of you, it's, yeah, it's, it's astounding because uh, yeah. you, you let your, uh, your heart guide in uh, such a very tough talk to talk to, unless you, you understand, you know, all the parameters of the subject. Um, you definitely speak uh, with, you know, sincerity, but, you know, with a command of leadership. So um, if, if I can just add one more thing, because I think it would be really important to emphasize, especially because I know that um, a lot of young people struggle with, you know, trying to introduce like artistic or creative professions to their parents. You know, it, it's not necessarily on my, at least based on my experience, it's not necessarily a clear cut yes or no. Um, there was support, but sometimes that there are other factors that layer and complicate that. And so I just had to figure out how to navigate it such that I was able to continue being creative, even though I followed a much more traditional path. Um, and then eventually came around and now I feel much more comfortable identifying as a writer and, and a creative. So sometimes it just takes a while to, to get to that point. But throughout the process, I would say that my parents were pretty supportive of my decisions. What was the first things that you were, uh, if you were a writer or were you a different kind of artist that you dabbled in before, you know, uh, moving on to uh, more, you know, academic uh, pursuits? Well, I, I really took my um, writing seriously. So a lot of people don't know this, but I was one of the inaugural Write Girls in Los Angeles. And Write Girl is an organization that mentors young girls and pairs them with established writers. And right now they're gaining popularity because of Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman's also a Write Girl. Um, and so I started with Write Girl and there was a point where I really wanted to be a poet and just wanted <laughs> to, to make that my job. But I think over time, and it wasn't my parents telling me no, I made the conscious decision that it's more of a passion for myself. I wanted to keep my writing for myself and I wasn't quite ready to, to bet on it and make it sort of my life's work because I felt like I had so much else to learn. And so now going back to what I said before, I feel like I'm coming back to that. And now I feel much more comfortable sharing um, my, my words. So it's, it's a lifelong journey of becoming a creative. I'm with you there, girl, I'm with you there. <laughs> Um, so tell us, you know, tell us about Bob Shelto's Policy and Art Collective, you know, how did this initiative come about in your work and, you know, uh, what was, you know, what were you found in its purpose in this many spaces that it occupies because it defined an intersection of, you know, nuclear policy, nuclear non-proliferation and arts. Um, mm -hmm. Many people would like kind of, you know, combine Put those, those two together. Yeah. yeah. So let me, I guess, begin by just sort of describing exactly what I do. So as as a day to day, so I'm a nuclear policy researcher. I'm really interested in the history of nuclear weapons, um, the policies that continue to sustain nuclear weapons, how governments um, and non-governments work together in order to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the nuclear policy field, I would say, uh, can be broken down to like three buckets, right? So there is the non-proliferation, which is just preventing the spread of more nuclear weapons. Um, there is the arms control, which is basically negotiations between countries that have nuclear weapons to decrease what they have. And then there's disarmament, which is the, the end goal, which is basically getting rid of them completely. And so those three circles sort of overlap. And my, I, I would say that my work takes me into those 
three spaces, although my specialty is non-proliferation. I'm really interested in nuclear materials like uranium, plutonium, probably things that you've heard on like Hollywood movies, action movies, um, and also like radi radioactive sources and how to protect them. So bad guys and countries that wanna create their own nuclear weapons program are not, you know, not able to. Um, so Bon Shalto is essentially, this is when uh, I would say I was in my like fourth year of doing this work. I was in grad school um, and I basically followed a very traditional path. If you want to do nuclear policy, you, you want to hit uh, a certain stride in sort of your academic um, education, you want to network with different organizations, as well as, you know, government entities, and then you've made it if you become like a pundit or a government hat, right? Um, but then going back to our point earlier about creativity coming back around, um, when I was in grad school, I was just like, wow, this is such a rich field topic of study and there's obviously some amazing cultural reference points like the Simpsons like Godzilla but there's no intention to try to figure out how those actually fit together at least the way that we were I was exposed to I'm sure that there was other artists anthropologists at that time already making that connection but within the policy circle we just really distanced ourselves from looking at the cultural aspects of what we do and how we then inform popular culture. Um, and I need to give a shout out to a good friend of mine, Sayaka Shingu, um, who I met in grad school. And she was really the one who um, helped crystallize um, alongside Adriel Lewis, uh, you know, Bomb Shalto, because Sayaka was the person, uh, she's uh, Japanese, and she was talking to me about how the Godzilla version, the original Godzilla version shown in Japan, actually had very overt uh, discussion and scenes about nuclear, just how bad nuclear weapons are. I mean, the Godzilla or Gohira was essentially awakened by a nuclear test that exploded in the Pacific. Um, but when you look at the American version, that's completely scrubbed from the narrative, right? And so that was back in, um, you know, early 2010s. And at that time, I didn't know that. And there weren't a lot of uh, conversations around that. And so Bomb Shalto, the, the first, uh, I guess, project of Bomb Shalto was just blogging about these cultural reference points and how they change depending on where you are and who's talking and so forth. And so that's essentially the core of Bomb Shalto is trying to figure out the intersections between culture, arts, and nuclear policy. And now that it's been, you know, a, several years later and it's had the time to breathe and sort of evolve, it's become this network of artists, historians, scientists, policymakers, uh, actually creating new artworks to complicate nuclear narratives, right? So as opposed to just blogging about what's already existing, uh, Bomb Shelto now wants to produce new artworks um, that is more reflective of um, the state of nuclear policy and sort of challenging us to think about how nuclear issues relate to our everyday lives. Um, that you, I enjoy what that you said that because um, you've always spoken in length in many of your talks that um, especially those in your colleagues and those you work with in the, mm -hmm. the around the world that they need to speak up more and be mm -hmm. uh, more expressive about what they care about, especially around nuclear policy. But I, I know we do uh, understand that not everything, especially for yourself too, not everything can be said out loud. Uh, you know, you have the NDAs <laughs> regarding <laughs> your work. 
So how do you uh, inspire those around you, especially through your work uh, in your own personal work to also speak up and educate uh, correctly about the information being provided and not be, you know, cause we're still mis I feel ignorant still about so much out there. Cause I often mm -hmm. think in terms of violence when I think of nuclear uh, weapons and mm -hmm. energy use, you know? Yeah, as you should. I mean, it is an incredibly violent artifact. It is founded on a very violent history um, and we should be talking about that violence. But the field itself is founded on secrecy. Um, there's actually a really good book that just came out called Restricted Data by a good friend of mine, Alex Wallerstein. Uh, and he basically talks about nuclear history, including the Manhattan Project up to the modern day in relation to the idea of secrets, right? To protect protecting information so that other countries don't use it against us. Um, and so, yeah, the, because the field is inherently or by design supposed to be protected, right, from foreign governments, it's also assumed this culture of secrecy. And I think part of that secrecy, though, over time has become very unhealthy um, gatekeeping, right? It's not just about the protection of, of information that should be protected because if it falls in the bad hands or materials rather, let's say nuclear materials, if they fall on the bad, on bad hands, then it's, um, it's bad for everyone. But I think that that also has become an excuse to just not relay information at all and not educate the public. But I think that that's wrong because it is the government's responsibility to keep us informed as to how, um, how they're maintaining security uh, by, by informing us of what they're doing such that we can trust that they are doing their best to secure us, right? Um, and part of that is being transparent about the roots of, of the nuclear field, which are, incre again, incredibly violent. Um, and you could probably see that it's a predominantly white field because of its roots, its histories. And I think that we can do a better job of opening that up um, diversifying it uh, so that we have much more, um, I guess, I, not only ideas, but different types of expertise to really expand what we mean by the nuclear field. Because right now it's oftentimes government people, right, who have an agenda <laughs> um, and I think that by opening it up a little bit more um, and, and showing how this issue connects again with like day-to-day -day living, mm -hmm. um, we could encourage people to actually pay attention to, to nuclear issues. And it's, it's really hard because on the one hand, and I wanna try to tease this out a little bit because I feel like I'm talking about two different things. So there's nuclear weapons, which is of course, incredibly bad and we need to do a better job of committing to get rid of them. But there's also nuclear materials mm -hmm. that are actually used for research, right? Um, not necessarily energy, but for research, for medicine like purposes, like x-rays and such. And those, um, if you have enough, enough of them in, in uh, certain quantities or certain forms, you can weaponize them. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're inherently bad. I think that's part of the problem is that when we think about nuclear issues from a cultural standpoint, it's really easy to blame uranium or blame sort of the phenomena mm -hmm. of nuclearity. But in reality, it's people. Like it's what we do <laughs> with the elements. It's what we do with the science. And we've, pers we've decided to pursue really terrible, egregious things with that science. And it's very difficult to walk that back, right? Um, and so that's what I mean about science literacy or science engagement is getting at that level of conversation 
But as it stands, we're still really bad at it because when we think of nuclear issues, it's still at this high government Mm -hmm. level of Russia versus US versus China. That's really uh, important too, but that's not the only facet of, of what encompasses the nuclear field. I hope that makes sense. It's a well, lot. It, 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 <laughs> you know, cause it, I'm glad you, you know, you elaborated further because it's, uh, it gets into the, the whole, uh, you know, creation myth that's been produced for us regarding, you know, the nuclear use and, and, and technology and also how it's being weaponized. You know, that's all we know is the narrative that has been given to us, mm-hmm. you know, since our childhood and to adulthood, we just believe blindly that oh okay that's just what it is and it becomes part of our lives where this manufactured piece through a stalemate of you know arms is kind of mm-hmm. crazy it's crazy it really when you think about it we only have this piece because everybody continues to create these weapons that mm-hmm. i don't know if they're ever going to use it it's like you know it's a machismo kind of game yeah. With each other. Can, can I make a, a point? Thank you for saying that because um, it, it, you just reminded me of a long-standing discussion I've been having with a friend about this problem that nuclear issues is inherently like, deeply Orwellian and that we, we argue both sides of peace, right? Like these weapons are peaceful in that it preserves peace by way of deterrence, which is, um, but when other actors have them, let's say, or Iran potentially, right? Like it becomes a bad thing. It's not peaceful anymore. And so we we change up our interpretations of peace. And I'm talking about it from a US centric perspective, right? Um, and then also there's another layer of peace as in peaceful uses of the atom, right? Like how, how are we actually using uranium um, or cesium-137, which is a radioactive source for industrial purposes, for agricultural purposes, that is, you know, for, for research and for the bettering of humanity. And so it's incredibly, it's an incredibly complicated field And I wish we had more thinkers to embrace and dive into that complexity because right now the, the, the narrative, the dominant narrative is that we need these weapons because they keep us secure. But that is oversimplifying the complexities of really the atom and what the atom has sort of bestowed humanity. Um, But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, really interesting work and and i wish more people thought about it <laughs> um i mean you've given me a lot to think about and i'm, gl- I'm grateful that you mentioned it uh, and you kind of talked about it because there is we've been utilizing nuclear energy and applications to our lives you know for a while long while now mm-hmm. but you know we're always stuck on you know what we think we know about it which is the negatives but however, that narrative continues to persist because those who control uh, right. the narrative or those who control the power of that can all often redirect people and also undermine people like you and those of your colleagues who wish to kind of uh, expand upon it, you know, uh, you know, try to silence that information. Mm-hmm. I can understand, see that can be frustrating. How has that been with your advocacy or those around you you have worked with in terms mm-hmm. of your work? Um, well, it's it's incredibly frustrating for sure um, because of the dominant narrative of nuclear deterrence. And I, I would say that currently the nuclear field can exist in its own universe, right? Like we have our own heroes and anti-heroes. Like we have the Manhattan Project and Oppenheimer and Einstein uh, and Niels Bohr, like the the romanticized version of the people who built the bomb and then regretted it immediately, (laughs) you know? So so we have that uh, like creation myth Mm -hmm. um, in in our universe. And then we have these entities like the, the US government, Department of Energy, Defense, State, the think tank community, like we have created this this universe in which 
um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to penetrate if you're like a lay person. And that in and of itself mm-hmm. is missing a large piece. So the past few years, I really dedicated my, my research and my work to unlearning that myth and expanding that universe to other expertise that's not considered legitimate. Part of that is the um, knowledge of frontline communities, um, mainly indigenous communities that have been affected by nuclear weapons testing and production, right? Going back to that myth of, you know, here's like the, the physicists and the politicians who built the bomb and dropped the bomb and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, there's also, um, the Navajo Nation, you know, indigenous Americans that had to deal with the trauma of having uranium, which was the special ingredient used for the earliest nuclear weapons um, back in the 1940s, 1950s, the trauma of having their their lands extracted of uranium or the Marshallese community who were displaced because that's where the United States Uh, tested their nuclear weapons, right? So the the myth, the universe looks very white and very conservative, (laughs) but it's it's actually larger than that. Um, People of color, indigenous people are part of that narrative, are experts as well. And I'm doing the hard work of unlearning and relearning in order to sort of bypass the initial frustration that I encountered working in this field, right? If the traditional sort of community that I'm in don't recognize these um, uh, these stories or these voices, I want my work to actually open up channels and portals and gateways to allow those people in, mm-hmm. right? So that I, I'm not alone. And I'm not saying that I'm a pioneer in this. I think that I'm just in service of, of making sure that it happens and and that there's someone from the inside, if you will, trying to build bridges to make these these connections. You know, you knew it when you you saw nobody else doing it. You're like, I gotta do it. <laughs> uh, I think you created a project uh, in collaboration with other uh, creatives, the ways ways of knowing project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I found that very, very amazing and interesting, you. Uh, you know, short films, uh, photography, narratives. I, 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 I wish I could see it, have seen it. I hope to see it sometime soon. So Yeah, it's not quite done. Um, we're editing it at the moment. Uh, we've decided to uh, keep it close hold for now uh, because of COVID. It's a 360 VR film. And so if we released it under these conditions, I think it would be it wouldn't be the, the experience we would want people to have. I don't think anyone's trying to put on goggles or, or getting together uh, to, to watch something under the dome, a dome uh, anytime soon. But yeah, it's it's coming coming soon, hopefully. Awesome, I can't wait for that. So um, I didn't miss out any, on anything. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, but just, you know, I wanna go into talking about uh, and something, you know, regarding how you introduce uh, creativity. Uh, you mm-hmm. you uh, you went to the uh, RISD or the Rhode Island yeah. School of Design. Uh, and shout out to Tom Wise. Anyway, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. it's all get the shout outs. You know, <laughs> um, you were there. Uh, I think during a semester with mm-hmm. these students, um, helping them uh, kind of re envision nuclear use policy mm-hmm. in a creative way. You got design students working yeah. with you to create in, uh, a future uh, of how nuclear use. I found it very interesting reading throughout that uh, essay and report mm-hmm. um, because uh, what were, uh, and you'll probably tell us, what were some of the epiphanies you found at the end of that uh, semester, you know, and what the t- students showed you and what you found in yourself when you- Yeah, so uh, RISD, that, that's one of, um, one of the, the best experiences I've had in the past, you know, five years. I, I just am really thankful for Tom Wise, who's the professor of that course, for inviting me um, and uh, allowing me to do a lecture and also come back to critique the work of, of his students. So it's a studio design class where 
students were just, uh, none of them had any knowledge about nuclear anything, probably as much as I did knowing the Simpsons, right? Um, the, the idea is to, to see how well they adapt to the conditions, like to, to the prompt that, that they're supposed to design for and basically apply all of the skills, the design skills that they've accumulated thus far in, in their education and try to come up with a, an object or artifact uh, to communicate something about nuclear policy, right? And so that was incredibly intimidating for them. And it was a challenge for me as a nuclear policy person, really having to simplify what I know in order to, to educate these um, undergraduates who know studio design. Um, but, but the epiphany there, at least for me, because I learned so much from those students, is the way they ask questions. And this is something that I am really reflecting on a lot these days. So in, so nuclear, the nuclear field, uh, a big part of it is knowledge production, right? We're, we're part of the knowledge e economy. We are experts in a very niche topic and our cur currency is our expertise. And I think that because of that culture, we tend to want to put ourselves out there as people who know everything already, right? Again, as I mentioned earlier, you've made it if you're the pundit that's quoted in all of the articles who show up on CNN, right? To, to say the thing, to inform people of, of what's, what's happening in the world, which there's nothing wrong with it. But I think that sometimes the culture of expertise doesn't allow for critical questioning. And what I learned from these students is that if you're a designer, if you're creative, you are curious about every single thing and you challenge every single thing because you want to know that world as much as you can in order to create the best design possible, right? Because oftentimes the best design is in the realm of you don't know what you don't know. Like it's, you, you can't even imagine it because no one's asked the right questions to get there, right? And that was just incredibly inspiring and humbling for me because I learned that those uh, students are also have their own form of expertise by way of just knowing how to ask the right questions. And I feel like within the knowledge economy of the nuclear field, we've lost a little bit of that um, because we're always under the pressure of knowing what is happening or always being on the spotlight, explaining the thing to someone. So we're not really good at asking questions. So I hope that I hope that answers your question. I don't know if that made sense. No, it did. And um, because as you know, uh, I think we are designers as well. And, and mm -hmm. um, it in for a lot of my friends working in the tech industry is also uh, in manufacturing of clothing. It's it's often you have to ask the questions of how to get to A to Z, especially in production, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what works in a, a natural setting in the world application to regular people. How is this, this, this for us clothing design? How is this shoe made? Is it comfortable? How does it walk and bend? You know, these are inane, a thousand inane questions, but it comes to singling out to a point, you know? Yeah, and yeah. something that's usable, under, understood, and can be applicable to our world, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, it makes sense. And that, you know, you almost find those two worlds kind of colliding and often they don't understand each other. I think it's just about an exchange of, you know, processes, you know, and uh, just letting people play, you know, yes. I guess that's what you saw. Yeah, uh, that culture of play just doesn't exist in a nuclear field. <laughs> uh, but that also just recognizing that play allows for you to imagine different worlds and see your issues differently. And I think nowadays more and more of my colleagues are interested in that. I think that the, the nuclear field has come a long way. Now there is more interest in artistic engagement. Um, there's a lot of partnerships with design, designers for this very reason. 
Um, and so it's, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I geek out in sci-fi, so it's, it's there arts and designs and science, you know, so I hope they just keep cool. diving into that side of themselves. <laughs> um, now I like to talk about, you know, uh, your current, you know, work in, um, utilizing, you know, what people know as the blockchain technology into, okay. you know, nuclear security. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, you know, understand it as now, you know, cryptocurrency and NFT art because it, there's a value to that associate ridiculous value to that. But how do you uh, find that technology being utilized uh, into nuclear security? And uh, man, uh, all of the work. questions that you're asking me, I feel like I need a whole day to like <laughs> <laughs> sufficiently answer. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? My bad. My bad. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, I would say. All right. This is actually a gripe of mine. I'm actually annoyed by the conversations around NFT because I feel like the potential of blockchain shouldn't be reduced to what I personally feel is just a trend, transient art fad. <laughs> I, I may be wrong uh, and it might grow into something larger, but I think the, the interesting thing about this uh, blockchain, or I will use the term distributed ledger technology, which is basically the larger umbrella term for technologies like blockchain, um, is that it's, there's this notion of being able to store data in a digital ledger, right? And in NFT's case, that's like the ownership of artwork, right? And being able to store that data in such a way that is incredibly difficult to manipulate or change. So that allows this really interesting ability to trace the provenance or origins of a particular thing, right? Being able to trust that data in ways you normally can't because it's really difficult to change or hack or what have you, right? Um, I'm studying that for nuclear security because I think that has fascinating implications in the way that we, we do our supply chain tracking and monitoring. Um, and what I think is much more interesting and sexier than NFTs is, is happening, I think, in the supply chain space, right? Like how shippers um, and receivers and regulators are monitoring how different shipments packages are flying around the world um, and, and making sure that they're not diverted or they don't miss a particular shipment. And this is actually being applied, like distributed ledger technology is being applied by Maersk, uh, I think in collaboration with IBM in order to do exactly that. I think Walmart and other grocery chains or companies are also trying to do that for their produce mm -hmm. so that you can track the provenance of mm -hmm. produce. De Beers, the diamond company, is also using blockchain in order to track the provenance of diamonds um, to ensure that it doesn't come from blood diamond industry. So there's also ethical implications. Like how can you prove that this diamond went through the right processes? Um, so the long story short is I'm really interested in looking at how we can track nuclear materials um, because nuclear materials are sensitive, they're dangerous, uh, and some of these transactions and movements are incredibly complicated because they come and go from all over the world. Um, I, I forget the statistic. Um, I, I, I don't want to say it because I might be wrong, but just kind of think about how from spent fuel from like a nuclear power plant to something as small as like a radi radiological source or radioactive source that I was talking about, you know, those are, um, I mean, there's some really strict security protocols around the movement of that material. But what if we could overlay that with, with blockchain, will that improve security and efficiency of our information flows so we actually know where things are so that these materials are not diverted. And I'm not necessarily 
a blockchain fan. I don't know if it's going to work. I'm merely asking the question whether this technology has any applications to nuclear material, what we call nuclear material accountancy. Can we account for, better account for where our nuclear material is um, as they move around the world uh, with this technology? So hopefully, again, that makes sense. I feel like that's such a reduced and simplified. Yeah. You do a great way of doing it. So don't worry. Awesome. You awesome. get into a nice thick sauce by simmering it down. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it really comes down. To, I, I, I feel like it, it's about that transparency that in the, in, in what I guess we all would want and they would want those who are the suppliers, but it's a matter, a matter of who would, you know, how much would they want, you know, how much transparency are they going to give? Yeah. And it's, and this is where I can just geek out for days, right? Because there is just thinking about companies like industry, you can, you think about regulators, you think about who actually end up using them and then multiply that by the, the crossing of different countries and different countries have different regulations. Um, They have different processes. There are some countries that prefer facts faxing documentation or emailing documentation. And so we're looking at how distributed ledger technology can help integrate some of these processes to make it more secure and sufficient. Um, And also just making sure again, that certain materials don't end up in the wrong hands. Uh, But we'll see, it's, this is still at the, the beginning stages of that project. But um, we're, we're really interested. I feel like we just need to explore it and whatever the outcome is, whether it's applicable or not, um, just making sure that we, we are up with the times and we actually do our research is, is what I'm, I'm interested in. Well, I tell all our viewers out there, uh, you hit Lovely's website. She has amazing papers already written. Thank on you. The project. And so definitely read up, you know, get your uh, knowledge up on the information because it's, it's coming. It's definitely coming. So it's, we can't really avoid it. You know, it's going to be adapted uh, one way or another in our life. So it's something that I'm glad you're already touching base in your uh, corner of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I want to, you know, before we start wrapping up here, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, all this writing you do, uh, amazing uh, personal essays to uh, talks about, you know, racism and, and um, sexism, you know, femi- feminism, as well as the way we utilize uh, nuclear energy and how it affects indigenous people. Mm-hmm. All this writing, are you ever going to write a book? Are you going to publish a book? Because I'm, oh, yeah. I'm ready for um, it. I, at the, well, I'm humbled <laughs> and also flattered by, by that question. Um, I would love to eventually, but if I'm being honest, uh, I'm not ready to, I can feel it. Um, because as much as I love to say that I'm a writer, it's one of the hardest things for me to do. Like I, 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 it's just so anxiety inducing (laughs) to write. Um, even though, even if it's just a personal essay, I've just incredibly, it, it just takes me in another space. And I feel like there's just so much more to learn, um, for me to, before I, I, I'm able to tackle a, a book. I would also say that, um, if, yeah, I mean, if I'm ever going to write a book, I would love to just compile some of the essays that I've written. Um, I see myself more of an essayist than someone who would do like a really long, um, long form. Uh, And one thing that I've been thinking about beyond nuclear is just how we process foreign policy today as millennials onwards. Mm -hmm. I haven't really seen a book that describes that, um, that tries to examine, again, the intersection of arts, the influence of technology and how that really broadened our understanding of the world, our connections with each other across countries um, and how that informs the dynamics of nuclear 
or not just nuclear, but foreign policy more broadly. And so that may be a book in the future, but I'd like to take baby steps and just write about it in short form first. And we'll see if it'll okay, well, you know, that eventually essay, be compiled somehow. Yeah, the essay collection, I got my money ready. And uh, definitely Adriel, Pusher, and Jose, since your essay collection's coming out later this year, uh, you know, let her know what's up, you know, cause uh, I'm ready for it. I'm ready, okay. ready for it. I'm a fan already. So sorry, lovely. You're, you know, you <laughs> look it into the, the, the ether. So well, well, I will, I will mention that um, because I feel like I'm not, I will hear from Adriel later being like, well, you have already written a book because it is true. Um, I, uh, I just came out with a book with, well, two books actually with Tammy Nguyen, who's an amazing artist, bookmaker, friend. Um, we've done these artist books with some of my shorter pieces about the atomic sublime um, and bloom. Bloom is about the the plant life associated with nuclear pathology and diplomacy. So maybe in the future, you know, I mean, they, they exist now, but maybe in the future they can become full-fledged books for massive public consumption. Yeah. Well, so, the first one's already sold out. The second one's coming soon, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting to put the buy button. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you kind of share, if you can share, anything that you're currently working on? Oh my gosh, there's there's a lot going <laughs> on, um, including Bloom. So Bloom is coming out. Uh, we are actually trying to grow, no pun intended, uh, that that project by bringing it to uh, possibly botanical gardens and having conversations and gardening around it and basically in incorporating um, these kinds of generative or regenerative activities around our reflection of nuclear history. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I just edited this poem called A Journey Home uh, written by six Marshallese students uh, as part of this other project I'm doing, which is creative writing for uh, Marshallese youth in Springdale, Arkansas. And it's a way we've been writing together as a way to reflect on their nuclear history, the nuclear legacy of the Marshall Islands, which includes the nuclear testing that we talked about earlier, um, and climate change. So that's, I'm really excited about that. Hopefully that will grow some more. Um, ways of knowing the film is, you know, we're continuing to, to, to work on that. Uh, and we're hoping to, to release a, a website later on that compiles all of the resources around uranium mining in the American Southwest and how one can decolonize one's thinking around nuclear history. So decolonization is one of those buzzwords that are, that are um, infiltrating the nuclear field. And they're like, what is this? I feel like we need to, to think about this deeply. Um, and we're trying to steward that in a place that's very genuine, right? It's easy to say that you're decolonizing something without actually doing it. Um, and so we're hoping to introduce the works of indigenous scholars activists who've been doing this for a very long time and just having an honest um, compendium of resources that talk about nuclear history to, to counter that myth, that universe that I was talking about earlier. Um, and I feel like there's a bunch of other things going on, but those are the three that I'm, I'm most uh, excited about. Oh, amazing. I know everybody just, I say, you know, bookmark her website. That's it. You know, that's all you need to Thanks. know. Um, maybe some last words, maybe call to actions and shout outs. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just shouting out to all the people who are watching this. I know this is being recorded. So uh, thank you so much for, for tuning in and learning a little bit about what I do. Uh, shout out, obviously, to, to Adriel Lewis, who's uh, been very supportive of Bomb Shalto um, since day zero. <laughs> He's like uh, the one who, who really pushed me to 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 make this uh, happen. Um, and I think my parting words would just be that just 
take a step back and really think about what it means to live in a nuclear world. Nuclear as defined in every single way, right? As a world that is in the shadow or lives under the shadow of nuclear weapons, you know, there's still like 13,500 nuclear weapons in the world in the hands of nine countries, 90% of it belonging to Russia and the United States, right? Nuclear can be the atom itself and how we're all made of atoms and how it can, it's been used for good and for bad nuclear as part of our future. There's a lot of debates whether nuclear energy is our future. And I hesitate, I really hesitate to embrace that because it's the nuclear fuel cycle has harmed a lot of frontline communities, most of which end up being, you know, black indigenous and people of color. And this is what I mean by it's incredibly complicated and there's not one way of looking at our nuclear world and I really hope people to think about it more deeply. And I think just asking these questions, grappling with their complexities will make us more aware. And I think over time that will help us kind of live with it, coexist with it more, more peacefully. So yeah, that's it. Um, maybe just uh, where can people find you? Sure. Uh, so you can go on my personal website, lovelyumayam.com. Uh, Bombshell Toe also has its own website, which is the arts and policy collective that I run, um, bombshelltoe.com. And if you're interested in just signing up and maybe participating in any way, uh, you can go on my website and sign up there. Uh, and I'm on Instagram, and Bombshell Toe is my handle. That's it. Lovely. Thank you for spending this time with us here at the Marine County Free Library uh, and sharing your work. And uh, I definitely know we're going to be bugging you for more talks in the future, especially that uh, the plant, the bloom project. Uh, I know. Oh, for sure. We would love to hear about that. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll definitely keep you posted. If anything, be well. I'll see you around. And everybody have a good weekend and where you're at. Be safe and we'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.